Welcome to Launch Window Research. Today I had the opportunity to interview Daniel Faber. Daniel is a seasoned space industry veteran and his relatively new company, Orbit Fab, is doing crucial work to develop a framework of infrastructure to allow humanity to have a large scale presence in low earth orbit and beyond. In other words, this company is building gas stations in space. I hope you enjoy. Daniel, it's so great to have you on the channel. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Nathan. Great to be on here. So what is OrbitFab's mission and why is it so important, first and foremost? Uh, our vision is a, a bustling economy in space that can support permanent jobs off Earth. That's, that's our vision. Uh, our mission is to create the fuel supply chain and the material supply chain to support that. So we like to call it gas stations in space. That's really where we're starting is supply propellant to, uh, to satellites that are in orbit. Uh, allow them to do things that have never been done before, extend their lives, uh, fly low, close to the top of the atmosphere where there's more drag, uh, reuse the spacecraft so we stop throwing them away when they run out of fuel. Uh, eventually, we'd like to provide fuel, water, air, 3D printer feedstock, uh, minerals to grow plants, all the kind of things you want for industry in space and for humans living in space. That's where we want to be in 20 years' time. Well, that's amazing. You've clearly got the whole vision laid out. So you're starting with fuel. What has your company done so far and what are your milestones in the next few years? Yeah, we founded the company in 2018. And uh, within a year, we had two tanker test beds on the International Space Station. So we built some hardware really quickly, had to get it all crew rated and everything. Uh, we, we, we pumped water between two test beds, which sounds simple until you realize how difficult zero gravity is. Uh, and also on, a, on the space station, it was inside the space station to test this equipment. It turns out if, if you have a gallon of water that gets loose, you can actually drown an astronaut because you can't wipe the water away. So it was a catastrophic level hazard was how NASA rated it. Um, yeah, you, you also can't yell for help if you're under an inch of water. Right? Microgravity, the, the surface tension is the strongest force. So we had to go through all of the hoops to be very careful to, to make sure that, uh, that we were doing things right. When we were done, we also pumped the water into the International Space Station. We became the first private company to resupply the space station with water. And of course, they got um, understandably paranoid about overpressurizing their water system and causing any leaks. Like you don't want to have to evacuate a space station because of one payload by a startup company that, that makes a mistake. So there are a lot of hoops to jump through. So that, that was the first year we got that done. NASA said it would take 24 months and we did it in four months. Uh, so that was that was pretty quick. Uh, when we closed our, our seed round 2020, uh, when uh, we got into that 2021, we launched the first operational fuel depot. So we have a fuel depot in orbit. It's uh, it's pretty small, minimum viable product, but uh, contains hydrogen peroxide, which is a great oxidizer and monopropellant. And that's available now for, for sale uh, in Earth orbit. So now we're working on the next piece of the architecture, which is a fuel shuttle, which can take fuel from the fuel depot and deliver it to an operational satellite. So that's the next piece, and that's going up in uh, about a year and a half. Amazing. So as you touched on, it's pretty difficult to handle fluids in space. Why is that so tough, and what solutions has your team come up with? The difficulty is that you can get like airlock in the pumps and, and things like that. Surface tension is the dominant force, not gravity. And gravity, <laughs> gravity is a force that, that sort of governs the macroscopic organization of matter on Earth. So you take that away and weird things happen because you haven't, like, no one's got experience with that. So that's that's always interesting. Um, the other thing that's difficult, of course, docking two spacecraft together. We need self-driving spacecraft, kind of like self-driving cars, but without the ground to push on, you get the six degrees of freedom instead of three. And, uh, and that complicates the math uh, and, uh, and just makes it more difficult. These are not technologies that haven't been worked on yet, but to put them in a system that's going to provide a low cost architecture uh, to build the inventory in orbit and get that up, the business model, frankly, is one of the most difficult things we have to get right. Of course, and talking about the business model, what kind of constellation architecture are you looking for? Like how many fuel depots to how many space tugs and what sort of inclinations? Do you have any plans yes. for that? So we're building a, a business in a, a market that hasn't existed before. So we can't look at existing market data and say, oh, here's where it should be. Here's what we should do. Uh, what we've done, we've, we've looked at historic sort of statistical uh, populations of satellites, where they are, what fuel they have, how quickly they use the fuel, those types of things, and uh, you know how, how big they are. 
And, uh, and we've also had to project into the future because the market is changing and say, where are our potential customers likely to be? So with that statistical model, we then do some grouping and try and figure out the time that it would take to deliver fuel to customers if we had one fuel shuttle or two fuel shuttles or three fuel shuttles. And then when the fuel shuttles run out of fuel, they need to go back to a depot to get more fuel. Similarly, where should we put the fuel depots based on this statistical model? And so what if only 1% of, uh, of the spacecraft are buying fuel? What if 2%, all these types of things? So there's a whole bunch of modeling. It's a very multi-dimensional optimization problem. And it changes very quickly as you get new data because really it's, it's somewhat sparse data right now. So we've done that over the next decade. We've modeled out, you know, we need uh, about 10 fuel shuttles and uh, uh, several dozen uh, fuel depots. But the exact, um, the exact rollout of that is, is really got a lot of levers and triggers that, that look to market feedback and where people are buying before we actually deploy. Of course. And I'm glad at the start of the interview, you mentioned carrying multiple fuels and more than just fuel. So after you get this initial architecture set up, like what do you think is the next step, the next big thing that is going to need to be serviced in space? We are servicing spacecraft that, that spend a lot of years on orbit. So it's storable propellants for spacecraft. That's where we're starting. Um, there are two main fuels, hydrazine and xenon. Hydrazine is a, a chemical fuel. It's got a lot of energy in it chemically. So it... Uh, uh, it decomposes on a catalyst. It sort of burns with itself, if you like. Um, creates a lot of heat, uh, and all of that heat energy goes into creating the exhaust and a high exhaust velocity to get a, a high fuel efficiency. Um, so you get a, a decent fuel efficiency with with hydrazine. It's a simple fuel. Uh, it is unfortunately quite toxic, uh, so it's quite dangerous to get up there. But uh, when it's in space, that's that's not a problem. Uh, the other fuel is xenon. It's a noble gas. There's no chemical energy in there at all. The energy has to come from solar arrays, but you can't have a, an electric satellite without propellant because unlike an electric car, you don't have the earth to push on to go forward. You have to take some earth with you and then do that with xenon. What, what effectively you end up making is a particle accelerator. So you ionize the xenon atom and you accelerate it up the back at extremely high velocities. That lets you get great fuel efficiency, but low thrust because you don't have a lot going out the back at any one time. And it's quite uh, uh, energy intensive. You need a lot of, of solar arrays, which, which weigh, you know, they have weight and cost as well. So there's a trade-off. But different missions, different uh, uh, requirements. Uh, those are the two predominant fuels. People are looking at different options, things that are less toxic than hydrazine, things that are more available and less expensive than xenon. Uh, and so we keep a close eye on, on where the market's going. Uh, we'd like to be out in front of the market and able to offer the things that people want to buy that are solving problems you know, for, for the majority of the customers the majority of the time. That's yet a few more parameters to put into the calculations as mentioned before, where do you deploy the depots uh, and how many is, uh, do we have multi-fuel depots or single fuel depots and, and multiple depots? And uh, at the moment, the jury's still out on that. We're doing a, a bunch of analysis, but we're starting with the simplest thing, which is single fuel depots running hydrazine um, that serves what the customers, the bulk of customers want, and it's the simplest thing for us to deploy. And then we'll build into all the other things. Great. So the primary demand for your service is expensive satellites flying at low inclinations uh, and preferably like larger, numerous ones. And that sounds like I'm describing an orbital constellation. So I know you might not be able to say anything about this, but have you talked to any builders of orbital constellations about using your service to keep them running? Oh, yes. We've, we've talked to lots of them. Um, we definitely see a lot of interest from Constellation operators. We also see interest from the geostationary communication satellite operators. They have very big, very expensive assets that last quite a lot, long time uh, in geostationary orbit. And that's been the backbone of the commercial space industry for the longest time. Um, the low Earth orbit mega constellations are, are vying to compete and to establish new markets and operate in parallel with those. Uh, and so, yeah, we talked to both. Uh, there are different uh, reasons for refueling, different benefits they see, different demand profiles. Uh, and so, yeah, we respond accordingly. But we'll be operating in both geostationary orbit and low Earth orbit. Amazing. So there are a lot of companies right now really waking up to how big of an industry space servicing is going to be. I think Rocket Lab right now makes more money from space systems than their launch business. So... Given that you're going to have a bit of competition, what sets OrbitFab apart? The first thing that we we realized was that there wasn't a good fueling port. Right? If you if you want to bustle, you need fuel. If you want uh, to so we want a, a bustling space economy, you can't get fuel in orbit though unless you've got a fueling port. 
Um, they have valves on them on the satellites at the moment. Um, they let them fill and, and drain the spacecraft before they launch. But those valves tend to be um, lock wired down. And, like they're basically secured and glued in place and welded and what have you. They're not designed to be refueled. So it takes a bunch of complex robotics to get them open and to be able to inject fuel into that, which drives cost. So we had a, a vision of a low cost architecture. We said, what, what do we need? Um, let's go all the way to removing the robot arms out of the picture because robot arms are expensive. So we do a docking with no robot arms, directly dock and attach to a grapple feature around the fueling port. So uh, when we had that, we talked to, to dozens of companies about what they would like to see. We married that with our vision of a low cost architecture and designed the first fueling port. And that's really our first product. It's uh, been adopted on several uh, Space Force and, and US government spacecraft. It's designed into over 100 commercial spacecraft at this point. So that's, uh, that's really where we started. Is let's, let's design that. Uh, and while we will, we will offer that um, under an open license so other people can can manufacture it, that thought leadership has given us a head start on everything. So that lets us build inventory, lets us sign long-term contracts with customers and suppliers, lets us build this up. At the end of the day, the winner in this is going to be the company with the most efficient logistics operation. And so for us, it's about efficient logistics and low costs, starting from an efficient and low cost fueling port and uh, and then going into, into everything else you might imagine. To, uh, to build a logistics company in space. Well, all of this sounds like you've built a very impressive company in just four years, which leaves me wondering, what was your experience before Orbit Fab and what got you into the space industry? <laughs> 25 years ago in first year undergrad, I decided that um, the most beneficial and, and useful and interesting thing that could happen for humanity in my lifetime would be to get off Earth if, if humans could start living in space. And, uh, and so I decided I'd work on that. I wrote down a list of industries that could pay for the first permanent jobs in space. Uh, and that list was, was at the time, tourism and mining. Uh, I've since added in-space manufacturing and entertainment content. You know, Tom Cruise wants to shoot a movie in space. Um, there's, there's a few other things. But, um, but really, uh, back then, 25 years ago, I, I decided I'd work on the, the technologies and business models around asteroid mining. So I built a dozen satellites and then started running companies. And Orbit Fab is company number four. Uh, see, most recently, I was uh, running Deep Space Industries, a CEO there for about two and a half years, and we had the big, hairy, audacious goal of asteroid mining. Uh, but what we actually built, a technology product, was small thrusters to move satellites around in orbit. Uh, we couldn't get a thruster to go out and prospect an asteroid for, for a small uh, spacecraft, but also a lot of other people were building small spacecraft for commercial applications, and they couldn't get thrusters either. And so we built the small thruster. It got picked up by, uh, you might know, a Capella, Black Sky, Hawkeye 360, uh, great little companies. So that's where a lot of success and then uh, was acquired by Bradford Space out of the Netherlands. Uh, but from that experience, you know, we built a, a small, very low cost thruster, but it wasn't that fuel efficient. So our, our customers had the challenge of having to take extra fuel and launch extra fuel. So when we asked them, you know, what, would it, what would an extra kilogram of fuel be worth if we could sell it to you on orbit? We were absolutely shocked by how much that value would be. Because of course, if you can have an extra kilo of fuel, you can do a bit more without having to build a completely new spacecraft. And uh, and so when we saw those numbers, we just, just looked at it and went, okay, that's it, we've got to do this business. So about a year after uh, uh, I left Deep Space Industries, we started Orbit Fab with this particular mission. Let's build the fuel supply chain in orbit. Uh, wrapping up uh, with a final question, what would you do with Orbit Fab as a whole if money weren't an issue or you got like, a multi-billion dollar investment next year. Gosh, so much. And right now we're building what you could think of as a downstream oil and gas company, I guess. We're, we're distributing fuel, we're building that out. So I hit the accelerator on that and make sure that we could just deploy instantly uh, all of our inventory. We'd go into multiple propellants and those types of things. But really the long-term goal of Orbit Fab and, and what I'd start working on directly is to build a midstream chemicals company. So that would allow us to take material from asteroids or the moon and manufacture that process it, turn it into feedstock and materials and things that people want. So we build something like Dow Chemical, I guess, in, in orbit. Orbit Fab uh, is not intending to become an asteroid or moon mining company. We fully intend to be all of the midstream and all of the downstream pieces. And so uh, if I had unlimited money, I'd hit the accelerator on that today because I think that sort of level of infrastructure is going to let people who are smarter than me build businesses that are going to be bigger than ours, right? It's it's the infrastructure that, that lets you build so many things. With fuel availability on orbit, with transport becoming 
uh, a trivial cost in in the system with material inputs you can start to to really build industry in orbit and if we can move heavy industry off earth we can actually save this planet and that's what we've got to do i think the only way really to get to net zero globally is to move heavy industry off earth and that reply, relies on the kind of supply chains that orbit fab wants to build well, I think that is a great answer. And to any billionaires who happen to watch this channel, I don't know if there are any quite yet, but clearly Daniel Faber and Orbit Fab know how to spend the initial startup money they have getting to the <laughs> ISS in four months. So we cannot wait to see what you guys do next. Thank you so well, much to, for joining us, Daniel. Well, to, to any billionaires watching or to people who are interested in joining us, I mean, we need smart people there. They're sometimes as important as billionaires. We need the smartest people. Uh, we have a phenomenal team. If you want to join us, find us on LinkedIn. Um, look us up. Check out our website. Love to hear from you. Uh, if you think that you've got a business idea that can build on the kind of infrastructure we're doing, uh, let us know as well. That would get us super excited. We'd love to work with you. Amazing. I'm still looking for internships next summer, so I will definitely be in touch. Please do. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Bye. Thanks, Nathan.